Welcome back to Decoding the Conflict Mindset. I'm Dr. Deborah Dupree, the Mindset Doc. And we're into 2023 in a great new season. And um, coming up as our next guest speaker is somebody truly incredible, Henry Yampolsky. Henry has had such an amazing career, starting off as a litigator and uh, finding himself quite unhappy and turned inward to expand his vision of the world. Henry and I engage in a delightful um, interview series uh, exploring the depths of what he's done and how his life has been transformed. And he's not only been a, a two-time TEDx speaker, uh, sharing his journey across the Himalayas on his motorcycle and how that influenced his life and changed his mind, but also on the topic of radical compassion as the goal of conflict resolution. Well, if you've listened to me before, you know I'm passionate about compassion and how the science of compassion shows up in us and can influence how we help support people navigating through conflict. Well, Henry is uh, an amazing, accomplished uh, author, speaker, as I've already said. He is a mediator. He currently teaches for the um, Center for Peace Studies and Violence Prevention at Virginia Tech. So don't go away. Listen and learn because Henry has some amazing gems. Get out your pad of paper and a writing utensil or your electronic notepad because you will want to take notes. He has so many gems. I can't wait to share. We will be sharing his uh links to his TED Talks, uh, along with his book, Dissolving Conflict, within an inner path for conflict transformation. He sheds light on how not just to transform conflict, but how to be restorative in our approach to conflict resolution, going beyond empathy, going beyond interest, into truly acknowledging where people are coming from. Stay tuned, pass it on, just a few moments, Invite your friends and colleagues. Again, you won't want to miss this. Again, welcome to Decoding the Conflict Mindset. I'm Dr. Deborah Dupree, the Mindset Doc. And uh, I am so excited to have Henry Yampolsky here today. And um, Henry and I always like to share with people we met on LinkedIn, uh, realized we had some you know, uh, common passions and uh, similar messages. And so uh, I've had a chance to share with our viewers and listeners a little bit about your background. But I want to just emphasize what an amazing author, mediator, educator, multi-time TEDx talker, and uh, enthusiast of motorcycle riding. I'm, I'm excited to hear about how all this unfolds. So welcome, Henry. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dupree. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm really compelled, uh, uh, you know, first of all, by the, just the title of, uh, of your presentation, which is also the topic of your TEDx talk released just a few weeks ago. And mm -hmm. so a uh, radical compassion as goal of conflict resolution and what a fitting topic since we're here talking about decoding the conflict mindset, understanding people, what's happening when they are in conflict. And so, um, uh, I'm going to start off by, uh, because of what you've shared with me, um, tell us a little bit about how that Himalayan motorcycle trek mm. influenced your life. Sure. Uh, well, in many ways, uh, Dr. Dupree, I came to work in conflict resolution and peace building through motorcycles. Uh, oh. I was working as a trial lawyer in Philadelphia and was feeling quite lost mm -hmm. uh, in my in my world. Um, I was certainly feeling quite lost in adversarial process and was looking for a passion. And this is where motorcycles first came into my life. Okay. I just, I started riding um, and just was found a passion in that. And it was then through motorcycles that I met an Indian mystic yogi person who became my teacher, who became my friend someone who really, really influenced my life in a very, very profound way. And I met him uh, after watching a film called The Highest Pass, where he led a group of Westerners on a motorcycle journey across the Himalayas. So I became his student. I traveled to India many, many times. And then, uh, and it was actually through uh, journeys to India and through connecting very, very deeply uh, with some teachings on nonviolence, that really originated in India. 
uh, that I decided to do this work. And then in 2018, Anand Marotra, uh, who's my teacher, my friend, the gentleman that I mentioned mm-hmm. to you earlier, decided to do the highest pass journey again. And since this journey had such an influence on me before, uh, of course, I was one of the first people to <laughs> sign up. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, in many ways, and this was, I was already doing work in conflict resolution. So I kind of thought this would be a diversion. You know, this would be, this would be a way to spend a few weeks riding motorcycles mm-hmm. in India uh, through some of the toughest roads in the world and, and kind of not think about conflicts and, 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 and peace building and, and the work that I was doing. As it turned out, actually riding a motorcycle across the Himalayas is like being in a very intense personal conflict. Wow. And as I did that, uh, Dr. Dupree, you know, first few days, I was very tense. Mm-hmm. Um, it was physically exhausting. It was mentally exhausting. Uh, and every moment, you know, was a moment that you did not know if you were going to make it just riding through India and 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 the crazy traffic and, and mountains and weather, uh, all of that. Mm-hmm. And as I continued to ride, slowly, I began to relax. And slowly, I started to tune in a little bit more into myself. And as I did that, I started enjoying myself more. And also, I felt more and more connected with other riders, with other people who were with me on this journey, where at first that was not the case. You know, I really wondered these were wonderful people that I really wondered how this would work. You know, people were so different and from so many different backgrounds and ages. And and the more we rode, the more our story, actually our individual story mattered Mm -hmm. less Mm -hmm. and the more and more connected that we felt. And so it was towards the end of this journey when we summited at Mm -hmm. 18,340 feet uh, at Kardung La Pass in Northern Himalayas that something very powerful and profound hit me. And it, and it was this, you know, there was really four dimensions to this journey. And later on, I realized that really these four dimensions apply to our conflicts and to the process of conflict transformation. So the first dimension is tuning inward, tuning inward. Yeah. And this is where we talk about mindfulness. However, we talk about mindfulness in a very different sense than we typically talk about mindfulness in the West. You know, very Western approach to mindfulness is this is something we do to feel better. But for me, what became very, very clear, Dr. Dupree, it was that mindfulness is something we do to get better at feeling, not to feel better. Mm, Interesting twist of words there, Henry. Yes, yes, because, you know... um, Actually, in this work and, and, and to deal with conflict, we want to become more sensitive, more sensitive to life, more sensitive, of course, to ourselves. And again, when I use the word sensitive, you know, sometimes that word has a negative connotation, yes. mm-hmm. has a gendered meaning, actually, right? We talk about someone being sensitive as someone being too reactive, someone being emotional. Mm-hmm. And that's not what I mean. I mean sensitive when we sense where other people are. Mm -hmm. And so that we can meet them there. And so uh, this became very, very important for me. You know, this is a a significant part of my life, but I also saw that as a powerful, critical tool of conflict transformation, tuning in. And whether we're talking about organizations, organizations to tune inward, uh, to ask the question why, to have uh, that connection with um introspective introspection and, and, and the reasons why they're doing the work they're doing, but of course, especially for individuals. Mm-hmm. And this is absolutely critical for leaders mm-hmm. to have that practice, um, mindfulness practice, practice where they go within, practice where they go within, again, not to feel better, mm-hmm. but actually to increase their sensitivity, increase their sensitivity to the world. Um, increase their their understanding of themselves and they can be more effective leaders and of course be more effective in conflict. The second dimension um, that became very clear to me was observation without evaluation. Now there is an Indian philosopher um, named Jada Krishnamurti who talked about observation without evaluation. 
as being the highest form of intelligence. And of course, you know, in um, a day-to-day interactions, mm-hmm. our mind and and all of us tend to tend to tend to have this very reductionist tendency. We need to put a meaning on everything. Mm-hmm. We need to put a label on everything. Uh, and that becomes very, very dangerous because it results in us communicating with each other in a very binary way, right? Mm-hmm. In terms of labels, in terms of conclusions. And of course, listening, listening to someone, I see it as one of the purest forms of observation without evaluation. And I think you and I, um, considering the work that we do, you know the power of listening in conflict and, and, and in conflict transformation. The third dimension is expansion, expansion. And this this has several different meanings, but one of the most important ones and what became clear to me in the motorcycle journey is where we expand from positions, Mm -hmm. from positions. And most of our interactions are very, very positionals. We expand from positions to and through interests, to and through emotions, to and through values to and through needs. So as you know, for a long time, the way in conflict resolution, the way in negotiation was interest-based, right? Right. Looking at interest. And I think interest are no longer enough because nowadays our interest, which is the reason why we may hold particular positions, very often is belonging to a particular affinity group. You know, Mm -hmm. I follow this person on Twitter. I listen to this particular TV show And that's really not all that helpful. So we need to go beyond that. And during this motorcycle journey, you know, I I really was connecting with my own needs. Uh, But also what became very clear to me as I thought, you know, as I was riding a motorcycle and I thought about all the conflicts that I've worked with. And also as I was dealing with this conflict, you know, on the Indian roads and, and, you know, dealing with other people, it became clear to me that most of our conflicts revolve around seven needs. And these seven needs are security, autonomy, authenticity, connection, peace, meaning, and expansion. And really, every conflict I've worked with here or internationally somehow touched on one or more of these needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The final aspect, the final dimension of conflict transformation that became apparent to me was exploration. Now, this has several different aspects to it. One, of course, is bringing curiosity into conflict, and that is yeah. absolutely transformative. But but there is something else, and that is moving beyond the binary. You know, whatever issues we take, even if we take the most controversial issues we now face as a humanity, you know, or as a country, mm-hmm. pro-life, pro-choice, gun rights, gun control, blue, red, white, black, Every one of this, these issues has immense nuance, complexity, mm-hmm. and ambiguity hidden behind these seemingly binary slogans. And for us, for me in, in the Himalayas, you know, to truly engage with this experience, I needed to lean in. I needed to relax. I needed to lean into every corner. And likewise, when we're dealing with conflict, we need to lean in and we need to engage Mm-hmm. with the complexity, nuance, and ambiguity. Um, and this is where the conflict becomes truly transformed, because this is where we move beyond the binary, beyond the consideration of us versus them and them versus us. Right. And that's ultimately um, what I see as the path for conflict transformation. Well, you've said so many remarkable things. I've been writing notes down to capture some of them. You know, um, I'm going to ask you to go back for just a moment um, because I believe that repetition reinforces retention. Um, you mentioned seven needs, and I, I realize I got five of the seven written mm-hmm. down. So I've got security, autonomy, um, uh, connection, peace, and expansion. Sure. Well, let me let me go back. So it's security, autonomy, mm-hmm. authenticity. Here we go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Connection, connection, peace, meaning, and expansion. There, great, great. 
Thank you. I appreciate you, you uh, repeating that for me. Um, you know, there's just uh, so many things that I can connect with with what you've said. And and uh, I know that I, I didn't even realize I was doing what you just described in, in terms of going beyond the binary. Uh, one of the things I always talk about um, is let's let's share our perspectives on things, not positions or perspectives. And I have what I call the 360 perspective mm-hmm. um, on my tips and techniques channel on YouTube where, you know, wherever we are on this 360 degree, degree circle around whatever the issue or conflict might be, um, there's a slightly different perspective. And so let's be curious about learning from that other person how they see things and and what can I gain from looking at things differently and in that way I'm expanding using your words and their their viewpoint you know the the bigger situation and I'm sure you probably have heard of um uh, William Urey's you know go to the balcony Mm -hmm. uh, concept Mm -hmm. from uh you know uh, getting past no and uh and so all of those things are about um you continuing to learn uh, I like to say, you know, always learning, always living and always growing. And so um, that fits right into your expansion thing. Yes. Um, well, it sounds like one heck of a journey across the Himalayas. And uh, um, you've, you've touched on the word transformative a couple of times. And, mm-hmm. and that leads to one of my questions is um, how can we respond to conflict in ways that are transformative and restorative? So I'd like you to build a little bit more. I mean, because obviously mm-hmm. your journey was very transformative in terms of how it shaped mm-hmm. and influenced you. Um, uh, a little bit about how we how we can help others do that, you know, as the facilitators of people navigating through conflict, but then also say more about the restorative part of it. Sure. So first of all, we have to change the way we view conflict. Mm-hmm. You know, a very Western view of conflict is that this is a competition of two narratives, one superior, one inferior, and then through processes that we devised, whether it's the courts, whether it's debates or other processes, the superior narrative will prevail. And I think that's a very limiting view of conflict. And I think that's a view of conflict that brings us into the binary and brings us into the win-lose mentality. So I think first we need to expand our view of conflict, not just as a, 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 as a competition of two narratives, a very binary view, um, but really as a multidimensional force, a multidimensional force that uh, can include multiple narratives uh, that can also be the sign that you know the, maybe there are some cracks in the system. Maybe it's a call for change. Maybe it's an introduction of a new paradigm. Mm-hmm. And so if we expand our view and definition of conflict, then the way we deal with this also has to change, right? Most of the time, most of the time, all of us react to conflict. And we tend to use the words reactions and response very interchangeably. Mm-hmm. But I, I think they have very different meanings. So I define reaction as our attempt to escape or control whoever or whatever is triggering us. And then I define a response as the action which is appropriate for the situation. Right. That begins. It, so, so, so it's not there is not one size fits all. It's an action that is appropriate for the situation okay. that begins from an undisturbed state. So the true distinction between reaction and response is not necessarily what the action and conflict may look like, but where it's coming from. So how do we transform our conflict interactions? How do we respond to conflict in a way that is more transformative and restorative? Well, we start by looking within. We start by looking within. We start by establishing a personal practice a personal practice where we have the capacity to sit with whatever is, to face whatever is, without the need to react to it. Because this becomes key for us to be very engaged, for us to be very engaged in life, in situations that we're dealing with, without getting entangled. Because the problem that most of us have is that we get entangled. We get entangled. Yeah. And that means we're just getting into that reactive space. We're getting into that reactive space. So the way we 
start dealing with conflict in ways that is transformative and restorative is first by looking within, by developing that personal practice. And again, emphasizing something that I said earlier, not to feel better, but to get better at feeling, to increase that sensitivity within us, to increase that awareness within us of all life. Because something that happens, something that happens when we start going deeper within is naturally we become more inclusive. Naturally, we become more inclusive. What does that mean? It means that actually we start experiencing others as parts of us. So if I experience you, Dr. Dupree, even for a moment as a part of me, if I experience you, and that's not to say that we're not different. That is not to say that we do not have different experiences. But if I expand my idea of me to also include you, Mm -hmm. then does anyone need to tell me? not to harm you. Right. It becomes insane, Wait. right? Mm-hmm. Even if, if we take my arm and if we take my leg, they're different. They look differently. They function differently. They, yeah, 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 they're, they're attached to different parts of the body. But yet if the arm starts, st- starts stabbing the leg, the hole bleeds. Right. So this is where it becomes critical. This is where it becomes critical. Where we go within to actually become more inclusive because at the core of all of our violence at the core of all of our violence all of our violence whether we talk about you know just what happened this and and as we're recording it you know there's just been few uh shootings yet again uh, in the united states or what's happening in my home country of ukraine or what's happening anywhere else in the world Ultimately, all violence begins with the idea. Mm -hmm. And the idea is someone is the other. Yeah. Someone is the other. So I will suggest the opposite of violence is not peace. It's inclusion. What is inclusion? Inclusion is when we actually start experiencing another being as part of us. That means we include them, right? Mm -hmm. Love is the act of ultimate inclusion. Because we start including another being, whether it's a child, whether it's a significant other as part of us. And then their needs become so important that they're superior sometimes even to our own needs, Mm -hmm. right? So we go within to practice that level of inclusion. And if we start in, in terms of responding to conflicts, most of our responses now focus on ways of progressive exclusion, right? If someone does harm, Mm -hmm. we look for ways to exclude them. Right. Mm -hmm. And the invitation is if we start using, if, if we start actually looking the other way, how can we bring them in? How can we include them? Even if their act of violence, even if their act of violence, if we start seeing that, as an opportunity to bring them in Mm -hmm. because that act of violence and this, you know, it's not an easy practice, right? If we start practicing inclusion, not only with people we profoundly disagree with, but people who commit the most heinous acts in our, in our culture, Mm -hmm. in our society, school shooters, you know, people who uh, go to the supermarket and shoot grandmothers for no other reason, other rather than the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. But what if we still refuse to see those people as them and us and still saw them as part of us? And here I'll paraphrase a writer and activist, Valerie Kaur. What if we saw them as part of us? We do not yet know. That means their violence is not separate from us. That means we have to confront our own violence that is reflected in them. Yes. And if we're able to do that, that's, that is trans, both transformative and restorative, because then we stop seeing conflict as something that we win or something mm-hmm. that we lose. We start seeing conflict as an opportunity for profound look within and for profound engagement and powerful engagement with others 
And we start looking at conflict as an opportunity to bring people in. Right, right. Yes, I oftentimes talk about the journey of conflict as an opportunity to repair, restore, and refresh. You know, take mm-hmm. on a new view of whatever uh, the conflict is, the person is. And that actually um, leads into my next question I, uh, that I want to put out there. You've elaborated on that to some extent as far as, you know, the opposite of conflict um, uh, I'm sorry, the opposite of violence is not peace, but inclusion. And so the question is, why um, uh, why, and how are our divisions actually not the problem? And so elaborate on that. I think you've already started that journey, but I want to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. So I get asked, you know, in this being in this field, and especially now um, mm-hmm. around the holidays, and we're recording this uh, around the holidays in, in North America, People will ask me all the time, so what do you think of all this division? What do you yeah. think of all this division? And, you know, we've been divided as people before. We've been divided as a country before. I don't think division is a problem. I think lack of vision is. I think lack of vision is. You know, lack of vision that is inspiring, that is inclusive, that can actually help people expand Uh, their idea of who they are. And this actually brings us to radical compassion. Mm -hmm. And radical compassion is very deep. I I see the way, so how do we we create a shared vision? We create a shared vision through radical compassion. So what is radical compassion? What is is this other than just a nicely sounding catchphrase? Well, radical compassion is, I define it as, Knowing full well, knowing full well and knowledge that we can never truly experience or know what someone else has lived through. In other words, we can never truly be in another person's shoes. But also, but also being deeply committed and connected to another person's humanity. So even though we don't know anyone else's experience, we can never truly be in another person's shoes. Mm -hmm. We refuse to other them. We refuse to other them. Now, radical compassion actually has, as I see it, four critical components. And they are similar to the components that I talked to you about earlier. Though there are slight differences. The first component is autonomy. The first component is autonomy. And this is where we honor everyone's ability, you know, everyone's self-determination. And this it does not just include parties in mediation. This is people generally, right? Everyone has the right to choose whether and how to engage with others. And sometimes the most compassionate thing we can do, if someone is truly being toxic, you know, in terms of what 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 they're sharing and in terms of right. where where they are, sometimes the most compassionate thing we can do is to leave them alone or you know not not to engage in that situation if we cannot if if that's not if that's not appropriate. The next aspect of radical compassion is inclusion. Mm-hmm. And the two are not the opposite. You know, autonomy and inclusion is not the opposite. Um, we can honor someone's autonomy. We can profoundly disagree with them. We can, you know, choose not to engage or disengage with them. But also, we could see we could see them as us, still mm-hmm. us. Maybe someone we prof- still profoundly disagree with. You know, maybe someone we don't want to engage with. Mm-hmm. They're not different from us. Yeah. They are not the other. The next component of this is, like we talked about before, is exploration, right? Um, Radical compassion. If we begin with the idea that we don't know, we don't know someone else's experience, then how do we find out? We have to ask. We have to ask, right? And this is where, in some ways, we move away from the golden rule, right? Treat Mm -hmm. others the way... You would like to be treated to a modification. Treat others the way they would like to be treated, right? right? right. And then and that means we have to engage with them. We yes. have to ask. We have to say, well, tell me more, right? Tell me more. Tell me what is important for you. Tell me how mm-hmm. you would like to be treated. And that can just that can, can drastically shift how we are. 
And then, of course, expansion, right? Expansion. This is where we expand from the narrow story and that sometimes we see in conflict because in conflict and in life, mm-hmm. we're looking at the world through a people of our own conditioning. Right. Very narrow vision. Of course, of course. And, and, and you know this, right? When, when, when we're dealing with folks in conflict, they're focused on past grievance mm-hmm. or in future anxiety. And, and, and they don't see anything else. They don't even see the present moment. But this is even beyond conflict. This is even beyond conflict. And truly, if you look through history uh, of someone who was able to communicate broad vision, you know, Nelson Mandela, Mm -hmm. speaking of division, you know, in 1994, um, when he inherited South Africa, South Africa was as divided as ever, right? Right. Along the race lines, along the social lines. And and I very often play to my students uh, Nelson Mandela 1994 inaugural address. Because it's hard to imagine any politician today sharing a vision that is that inclusive, sharing a vision that is that expansive from a person. If anyone's ever had a legitimate grievance, right? Nelson Mandela had a legitimate grievance. He spent um, most of his life in jail, cost him his personal relationships, you know, um, his health. All, all the things. So if there was ever a person who could state a, a legitimate grievance, he was it. And yet he refused to go there. And yet he was able to not only build, but share that mm-hmm. vision that was truly ex- inclusive, that it was truly expansive. And that helped, you know, this very, very divided nation to come out of apartheid and, 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 and to create um, you know, truth reconcil- reconciliation processes, right. and and to try to rebuild um, society, which was nothing short of remarkable, considering where South Africa was, you know, in in, in the mid nineteen nineties. Doctor Martin Luther King Jr. Again, the the, the mm-hmm. famous "I Have a Dream" speech. Right. He's sharing a broad vision, right? And again, at that time, the country was probably more divided. Yeah. Um, than it is, than it is now, uh, and yet he was able to share a vision that to this day, to this day, now 40, 50 years later, it's mm-hmm. still something that we go go back to. It's still something that resonates. So it is not the division. It is not the division that is the problem. It is lack of shared vision. Right. And sadly, sadly, right. A lot of our politicians and a lot of our leaders, instead of trying to communicate that shared vision, they go to the lowest common denominator, Mm -hmm. right? And they emphasize the divisions and they use these divisions Mm -hmm. for for their own purposes. They they, they use these divisions. And that's sadly, um, very sadly what happens. But I do think with radical compassion. Mm -hmm we as a humanity can have a shared vision for moving forward. And if we do, then our divisions are not a problem. In fact, they can be a gift. They can be a gift. Our divisions can be a gift because we don't ultimately want, ultimately we don't want singularity and we Mm -hmm. don't want, right, everyone to be the same. We want to have different perspectives and ideas and that's what ultimately makes us all better. Yes, yes. You know, I, I, um, you so clearly and eloquently, you know, established how, um, uh, you, mindfulness, you know, again, not to feel better, but to better feel is such a critical tool of conflict resolution. And that's, um, uh, because I see that that's been, uh, uh, one of the real challenges in the current, well, I, I will say that the, the art of mediation, the practice of mediation, the science of mediation has been shifting. And uh, thanks to the the, likes of people like you and my esteemed colleague, Harold Coleman and and others Mm -hmm. who have taken, you know, gone beyond just the issues at hand. And in fact, uh, I was on a podcast with Harold Coleman just the other day, and he was talking about, you know, people process um, and um, uh, what was the last one? Peace, peacemaking. But then he also said, you know, we, we oftentimes come into conflict resolution with a focus on the the facts, the laws, and the people. Mm-hmm. But too often, 
um, you know, many practitioners of mediation, and I will say, particularly from a legal background, um, you know, focus on the facts and the law and forget about the people. Mm-hmm. And and so what you're saying is exactly where we really need to go beyond and to tap into, uh, again, not necessarily understanding where people are coming from, but acknowledging um, their journey, their path, their challenges, mm-hmm. their difficulties to um, then get a glimpse and insight into what might be driving their current behavior and how can we expand beyond that? There, there's, your words again. Yeah. I'm wondering, do you have any specific tips or strategies? Because one of the questions is how do we move from reacting to conflict with fear, avoidance, aggression, to responding with strength, clarity, and compassion? I know you used the word curiosity before, and I use that a lot. You know, we have mm-hmm. to be curious to be courageous, and we have to be courageous to be curious. So what what are one or two tips that you might share with our listeners? Mm. So first of all, first of all, for your listeners who are mediators, who are uh, conflict resolution professionals, peace builders, I think it's absolutely critical to have a personal mindfulness practice. You know, not just something that we do occasionally, mm-hmm. not just something we we do to deal with stress, but something we do very, very intentionally, so that we can start showing up as peace mm-hmm. to this work. The second critical thing I think for for everyone um, is connecting with what we don't know, acknowledging and honoring what we don't know, and especially when it comes to people, and especially when it comes to people. You know, we Mm. tend to live, again, um, our Western society, right, based on humanist principles, um, tends to place great value on knowledge, right? And so many of us define ourselves in terms of what we know, the colleges, the universities we went to, maybe letters we have after our name, maybe articles or books or, uh, you know, content material that we've produced. And all of this is wonderful. All of this is wonderful. But regardless of how much we've done and how much we've written in letters after our name, there's always going to be more we don't know than we do know, Right. Right. And and this is in in mediation, in in, in conflict resolution world, for us to truly move from reacting to responding, this becomes critical. And this is what I tell my students, you know, every situation they're dealing with as as mediators, as as conflict resolution professionals, as even as therapists, if we start asking ourselves, what is it that we don't know? Mm -hmm. Instead of, because so many of us, you know, um, tend to be problem solvers. Someone comes to us, you know, they're paying us a lot of money. And, and I'm talking about those, you know, maybe folks in the, in the legal field or conflict resolution field, or even the field of therapy, psychology, mm-hmm. right? People are coming to us. They're paying us a lot of, a lot of money uh, mm-hmm. per hour, and we want to be helpful. We want to serve them. And, you know, we want to show them that we can solve whatever the problem that they have. Except very often what we perceive to be the problem, or even they tell us what the problem is, that's not the problem. Mm. That's not the problem. And for us to truly be conflict transformers, Mm -hmm. not just mediators, you know, not just settlement agents, we need to go deeper. We need to, and and this, this is, this could be very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. This could be very uncomfortable because there we have to face the uncertainty, right? Right. But the uncertainty of what is it that we do not know? Because if we start with that, what is it that we do not know? Then naturally questions begin to arise, right? Mm -hmm. Then the natural curiosity, if I don't, because the moment I say I know, the moment I say I know, this is a closing statement, right? Yeah. Yeah. If I know what is what else is there to learn? If I if I say I know your experience, then I know what is right for you. But if we begin with it, and this is where I even will say to people that we need to move away from empathy mm-hmm. as the goal or even a consideration in conflict resolution, because we can never truly be in another person's shoes. I can yeah. never, even if you and I live through exactly the same experience. Your experience of that experience and my experience of that experience may be very, very different. Absolutely. Because we had different lives, you know, different mm-hmm. conditioning. We're in different, maybe in different stages of life, et cetera. 
So if we begin with the idea that we don't know anyone else's experience, mm -hmm. then we engage with them. Then we ask, tell, tell, tell me more, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me, mm -hmm. help me understand that experience. And we're not so quick with problem solving. We're not mm -hmm. so quick with settlement. We're not so quick with compromise. Sometimes those are useful and necessary and appropriate tools. But I think when we make them the goals, mm -hmm. when we make them the goals, you know, settlement is the goal of, of, of mediation, conflict resolution, or compromise, I think we lose a lot. Yes. And very often what we lose is the possibility that this interaction can be transformed. Possibility that this interaction requires some healing, some understanding, uh, that this interaction, uh, which may seem to be, and, and look, there are situations that are purely transactional mm -hmm. and, and, and those situations that absolutely mm -hmm. is appropriate for us, you know, to help parties come to a resolution of the transaction. Mm -hmm. A lot of situations are not. And where we take a transactional approach to a situation that is not transactional at all, we're doing great disservice. Right. Right. And that, that applies to leadership as well as to um, conflict resolution and your transactional versus uh, transformational. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I heard you say is, is that, um, you know, we, we need to move beyond empathy. I mean, the recognition that empathy was essential in helping people navigate through their differences was key. Um, but that's something, you know, from a neuroscience perspective, what we actually know about empathy is that it still shows up in the side of the brain closest, closer mm. to pain. And it's mm -hmm. only with the expansion of, of empathy to compassion, a gesture that supports somebody where they are to try to mitigate or resolve their pain, mm -hmm. uh, then shifts over to the side of the brain closer to the area of love. And we generate different um, neurochemicals mm -hmm. in our brain as well. And so um, that's something that I often speak about too. We, we need to go beyond empathy and to show that, that show of compassion. And a lot of people become afraid of that word compassion. Mm -hmm. And um, in a, a few years ago, I stumbled on some of the works of um, the Dalai Lama when he was speaking at New, um, Times Square in New York. And um, he talked about compassion and how, uh, you know, we needed to shift our mindset about compassion. And he, he reframed compassion to nothing but warm heartedness. You know, mm -hmm. when you feel warm hearted, you want to do something for somebody else. And that's really what he was getting at. And I have found really resonates um, when I mm -hmm. share his his words around that to people, um, because I think otherwise they they tend to fall into Mother Teresa or Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King giving up, you know, what they uh, so much of what they did uh, for the good of others. And um, a lot of people are not ready to go there. I'm curious, uh, Henry, you know, um, you have an interesting uh, title to your book, Dissolving Conflict from Within, an Inner Path for Conflict Transformation. And so interesting play on words there. So say a little bit more about your book. Sure, sure. So first of all, in so many ways, my book um, is based on my own spiritual journey. And this is important and important in, in terms of the title. And of course, title is a play on word, especially the word dissolving. Right. And of course, you know, in part, this play is because in the West, we're so focused on, on finding the solution, mm -hmm. on finding the solution. But, you know, um, actually in the yoga tradition and, and, mm -hmm. and in the teachings that became so dear to me in India, the solution is to dissolve. The solution is to dissolve, right? And again, it, it, this may seem very counterintuitive to... Um, someone in the West and someone mm -hmm. where, you know, our individuality um, is so, so important. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the yoga tradition, we talk so much about dissolving, dissolving into nothingness, mm -hmm. right? We dissolve, we dissolve, we become, we become emptiness, we become nothingness. And then, you know, this is the beginning of true transformation. So this is the play and words where, the solution to conflict is to dissolve and also to not when we dissolve right we become if you think about it when we dissolve or if you, even if you take you know a packet of sugar and and you dissolve it in water mm -hmm. sugar and water become inseparable they become one right 
and so that's another key for us to dissolve to dissolve conflict. What I said earlier, right? If we start dissolving into each other, meaning we start experiencing each other as part of us, as part of us, right? Seeing each other, not and it's not necessarily where all the differences disappear, but we start seeing every one of us as part of a greater whole, as part of a greater mm-hmm. whole, and we'll dissolve into that greater whole. Then again, if we do that, if that truly becomes our experience, violence becomes impossible. Right. It becomes insane. Um, so all of these things, um, you know, are part of my book. Um, but also I want to make it, you know, and my intention with the book was not to make it academic. Mm-hmm. Um, it certainly has, um, it, it certainly shares, you know, some of my um, spiritual uh, aspects of my spiritual journey, but it's not a spiritual book in that mm-hmm. sense too. Uh, really, my intention was to make it a very, very practical guide for leaders, mm-hmm. for conflict resolution professionals, but most importantly, for ordinary people mm-hmm. who are trying to deal with conflict, who are trying to deal with division, who are trying to, you know, who are concerned about what is happening in the world. And in my view, the book provides, well, offering, you know, it, it is certainly based on a lot of the teachings from the East. It is not a philosophy book. You know, it is not a um, kind of a, a, a new age book. It's a book that I hope is very, very practical. It has very, very practical ideas and suggestions for how we can truly transform our conflict interactions. And the key, the key to that is for us to first and foremost turn within, because that's ultimately, that's ultimately where all our conflicts begin Mm -hmm. and end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, using an example of Gandhi, right? When we say, well, yes, that's great. Am I, but by turning within, how am I going to impact the conflict in Ukraine? Or how am I going to, you know, impact all these other terrible injustices and things that are happening in the world? And the answer is, well, yes, one person can impact the mm-hmm. world in that way. And again, if we look at Gandhi, if we look at his teachings on nonviolence, if we look at who he was as a being, that originated with his personal practice, that originated mm-hmm. with him turning within. Right. So that's what the book is suggesting. In the, in the book, I talk about you know the four dimensions of conflict transformation that you and I talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. But also to each of them, there are some very, very practical ideas of how can we apply this and bring this into our lives that are busy, that are complex, you know, that have all these different uh, pressures on us. How can we apply these teachings, you know, to interpersonal interactions, but also how can we apply these teachings to international and social justice movements uh, that impact us all so that's what my hope is for the book you know Mm -hmm. that it offers a very practical way for people to start seeing conflict differently for people to start responding to conflict with strength with clarity with compassion instead of continuing to react with fear with avoidance or with aggression wow (laughs) Um, this has been, uh, I knew this was going to be a very rich and um, uh, in-depth uh, interview with you, Henry, and uh, you have fulfilled and exceeded every every anticipation that I could possibly have had. Um, I've just, I, I, I myself find um, myself responding and responding, you know, to so many things that you've said, and I've been feverishly taking notes, like I mentioned, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the the consistency and the complementarity of what you're saying and, and, and some of the things that I put into place uh, with my, my clients and my approach to conflict resolution, very, very similar. Uh, again, your words are eloquent and uh, your framework of thinking is, is um, uh, amazing. And so I'm excited to um, uh, share with our viewers, our listeners, um, you know, this practical guide that you've created that can really help shift the mindset in starting within and then continuing to spread it. And uh, as uh, I like to say, compassion is contagious. Um, mm-hmm. And so you know, how we show up matters. The words we use matter. 
and um, and so I'm I'm really excited to to have you as part of our our, our interview series so that people can, can continue to learn about as the series is called decoding the conflict mindset because there's so many inner workings and perspectives and things like that and I think you know as you were talking about turning within you know if you and you probably have already recognized this but one of the things I realized is that the connecting link between you know some of our greats like Gandhi and Mandela and um, you know, Martin Luther King and, and, and on, that <clears throat> they all had that inner sense, that, that, mm-hmm. that inner vision of how they wanted to see the world. And so it definitely was something, uh, you know, working from inside, uh, moving out, and then look at how much each of them, you know, uh, uh, shaped our worlds in such tremendous ways that, you know, continue to live with us uh, now and forever. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, thank you, Henry, so much. Uh, I just want to share with our listeners and viewers uh, 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 in some of our our, um, materials going out, I'm going to be sharing with you the links to uh, Henry's two YouTube talks. And uh, I I can't wait to show them the picture of you on your motorcycle. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you. I I really enjoyed our conversation. You're doing very, very important work. uh, And it's wonderful to collaborate in this work with you. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And uh, don't worry, our paths will continue to cross. I'm sure of that. Okay, great. Good. Well, thank you again to our viewers and listeners. Thank you so much to Henry Yampolsky for being such a marvelous guest speaker and uh, the the deep insights that he shared with us from his journey, as well as uh, as well as as his experiences throughout life. So I'm Dr. Deborah Dupree, the Mindset Doc. Join, pass on, share this episode of Decoding the Conflict Mindset. Well, I hope you enjoyed Radical Compassion with Henry Yampolsky. Quite a journey across the Himalayas on a motorcycle. Wouldn't you agree? One of the things I like about what he had to say was that mindfulness is not just about feeling better for ourselves, but getting better at sensing where others are coming from. That to me is says it perfectly in terms of decoding the conflict mindset. Well, on that same note, Our next guest coming up on February 2nd is Bryant Galindo. Now, some of you may remember that Bryant was a guest of mine early in 2022 uh, as he was getting ready to launch and publish his own book, The New Middle. What I love about Bryant, and I want you to tune in, mark your calendar, keep it on mind, is that Bryant comes from a younger generation and he had a life threatening situation that totally changed his life. He not only brings to us real world experiences about the impact of nearly being killed, um, to the metamorphosis he then underwent and how it changed and influenced how he looks at things so very differently. So Bryant talks about intergenerational conflict in the workplace, uh, particularly among uh, entrepreneurs and new startups. And so he is just a world of wealth when it comes to businesses getting launched and yet working across the divide of our multiple generations in today's work world. So come on back, February 2nd, 1230 p.m. Pacific time, Bryant Galindo, the new middle. Can't wait to have you join us. Dr. Deborah Dupree, The Mindset Doc.